I'm going to talk today about freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and how it relates to the new diversity, equity, and inclusion. So one of my favorite verse related to speech is, now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. That's what God said to Moses. So an outline of what we're going to talk today, we talk about freedom of speech, a little bit about the legal background and historical background, um, freedom of speech protection at universities, public universities in the United States, um, organizations that defend free speech, the history of how I came to value principles of freedom of speech and religion. Some story at MSU, I work for Michigan State University, um, MSU and uh, conscience as a student, my story as a graduate student, um, COVID, DEI, LGBT issues currently, um, and we will conclude. So, freedom of speech, legal background and history. If we start all the way at the beginning, there was a war in heaven. And this war in heaven was between Satan and his angels and God and his angels. And the war is called polemos. In the Bible, polemos is a Greek word that means debate or polemic. That's where we get the word polemic. So it was a war of words. God could have destroyed Satan and his angels. God could have destroyed Satan when he started speaking behind his back and really tearing down the universe that he created and corrupting information, but he did not. He let him talk. One third of the angels sided with him. And then God made Adam and Eve and he put the, fr the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden and he could have not allowed them to fall. He could have not put that tree, but he gave them that choice, the choice to either obey him or obey Satan. And we know what they chose, but that gives us an idea that God believes in choice and he believes in freedom because love can only be love if you have the ability not to love. Just like in a hu husband and wife, if the wife is not free to go, if she's captive, that would not be love. Love is only love if you have freedom to, le to leave. And God provided the freedom to Adam and Eve and to all of us. He gives us freedom of speech and freedom of conscience to follow or not to follow him. So in the past, there's multiple, many, many examples of freedom of speech and religion. But a very famous example is Galileo. Galileo was living in, an, in, in, in a time where uh, really the Catholic Church reigned supreme in, 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 in Europe, at least. And he he, he, he understood by studying ancient um, texts and also through his observations, etc., that the earth goes around the sun and not vice versa. At that time, the church was holding that the earth is in the center and is immovable and that the sun goes around the earth. And because what he said was so controversial, he was forced to recant. And he was all his life in house arrest because of simply saying the truth, the scientific truth that the sun goes around the earth. That is a great example of censorship and lack of freedom of speech. And that also demonstrates that infringements of freedom of speech can come from the church, it can come from government, it can come from the world. 
it specially comes for from whom hold those that hold power so those that hold the power can then censor those that have less power especially if they have political power armies etc so that's one of the dangers when of church and state being combined when the church can dictate what you can believe what you can say scientific advancement is very connected to freedom of speech only in times and countries and area where freedom of speech is allowed can science truly advance we can also think of the Dark Ages versus the Enlightenment and Protestant Reformation. What made the Dark Ages dark? One of them, one of the reasons, is that knowledge was not allowed to be explored. People were censored. People were not allowed to interpret the Bible on their own. They had to listen to what the priest was saying. They had to listen to what the Pope said and could not think or interpret the Bible on their own. Well, it's all connected. If you cannot read the Bible and interpret it on your own, neither can you look at the, at the natural world and interpret what is happening on your own. So therefore, there was dark ages, biblically in the knowledge of scripture, but also in science and in every other field. And then the Protestant Reformation came. Some of the first Protestant reformers, people like Haas, Jerome, and a few others, were martyred for standing against this power. They had very little freedom of speech. If they spoke against the power at the time, they would be jailed, they would be tortured, questioned, etc. People would lose their jobs, people would lose their property, etc. But as this grew, there came a great man that stood against this power really all alone, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was brave enough to put his 95 Thesis on the door of the church. And they described the different corruptions going on at, at the church and different really complaints that he had, um, very valid concerns that he had. He should have, going through past presidents, he should have maybe lost his position or maybe even lost his life. But the, the powers that be, the governors, the, um, the, the, the people in power in Germany at the time, defended him and protected him. And he was allowed to be judged in, in Germany instead of in Rome. And that made all the difference. And this one man standing, this one man standing, allowed for others to stand up. And uh, that great power that was censoring and silencing every silencing every, everybody else started declining and freedom started rising. And with the freedom to explore and to follow your conscience, with religious freedom also came scientific freedom and knowledge increased and new discoveries happened and life for people really improved. The Protestant Reformation was going from light to light. The big difference is that the Protestant Reformation said you can follow God according to your conscience. You can read the Bible on your own and follow what it says according to your conscience. What the Catholic Church was saying was we are the authority you need to listen to us and you cannot interpret the Bible according to your own conscience there was a mediator between God and the people and those were the Pope 
um, cardinals, etc. It was the church. And that had an effect, of course, in, relig in religion and etc. in conscience, but it also had an effect in science and all kinds of knowledge. Well, similar oppressions and persecutions happen in, in England, um, not quite as bad, but there was also persecutions in England. And many of peoples from Europe escaping um, England, persecution, um, like, like you say, the pilgrims, and escaping persecution from other areas of Europe, came to the new land, to the new world, searching a new life where they could follow God according to your, their conscience. The U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights, when it was made, it, it, it's a beautiful document. I think it's divinely inspired. One, one, of the, my, one of my favorite parts is the First Amendment said the Bill of Rights. And it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So the part of freedom of speech says, or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. So Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. So this is relating how the government is relating to the people, Congress. In other words, the government cannot thwart the freedom of speech. Okay, they cannot compel speech. They cannot um, abridge the freedom of the press or the right of people to peaceably assemble. This is not necessarily in private companies, doesn't apply to them. It applies how the government can relate to us, can and cannot relate to us. Um, the freedom of religion. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, the government cannot be a conscience for us. They cannot make, they cannot join with the church and be church and state combined and the state force religion, neither prohibit us from exercising our conscience and exercising our religion. A great example that I saw is um, the, it, the, the Supreme Court has um, clarified the First Amendment rights through cases. Um, one of them is a case involved a Seventh-day Adventist who was denied unemployment benefits in South Carolina because she refused to work on Saturdays. Okay, so this, this is a case I thought is it's an interesting case because it, it includes a Seventh-day Adventist. So different cases that have gone to the Supreme Court um, have further clarified the meaning of the First Amendment. Besides the First Amendment, besides the First Amendment, which it's in the Bill of Rights, there are several federal and state laws that protect free speech multiple. Pretty much every state in the United States have laws that protect free speech, and many countries have laws to protect free speech. Many countries, um, including Canada, where I am right now. Um, one thing that we need to discuss is freedom of speech in the culture, because we can have laws that protect free speech, but if the people do not protect free speech, there will still be censorship because 
people as a mass are powerful. If you have the students in a university and the professors and they do not support free speech, then uh, the environment will not be conducive to free speech. It will not be conducive to debate. There will be silencing of people. There will be censorship. And who makes the government? It's made by the people. So if the majority of people do not support free speech, laws will be changed. Judges will interpret the Constitution in the wrong way, in ways that do not support free speech. If they do not hold free speech protections in their heart, if they do not believe in freedom of conscience for the people, they will not judge rightly. So this is important to have freedom of speech in the culture, that people understand freedom of speech laws and protect them, and that they understand that freedom of speech protects everyone especially the most vulnerable, especially minorities, especially the voiceless. Because in history, we can see that many times the powerful, the governments, the, the religions that are dominating an area, they are the ones that are able to censor those that have a dissenting view and expel them from their job or not allow them to speak, silence them, or sometimes jail them, send them to concentration camps, gulags, or even put them to death. So freedom of speech protects everyone. And if you don't like freedom of speech because right now you are powerful and you are in the majority, and you think you can censor those that you whose opinions you despise, you might not be in the majority always. You might not be powerful always. And then would you like those who you despise to hold power over you and not believe in free speech and be able to take your ability of, to have free conscience? Well, do unto others what you would like them to do to you. If you want free speech for yourself, if you want free conscience for yourself, then provide that for others. A law professor at MSU, I went to one of his talks a few months ago, and I am paraphrasing. This is what I remember he said, that we are experiencing the Protestant Reformation in reverse. So freedom of speech is going down. Instead of us moving like during the Protestant Reformation from light to light, from freedom to freedom, from knowledge to increasing knowledge, we're going, we're losing. We're on the downhill. People are beginning to not support free speech. There is censorship. There are calls to control our conscience. Um, regarding university, I'm a professor at university, so I have a special interest of what's going on in universities. There is a statement, it's called the Chicago Statement, um, adopted or first written in the University of Chicago. And it, this document is found at the FIRE. FIRE is a free speech organization. I provided the link for those who want to read the whole Chicago statement, which is a very good statement. One expert from the Chicago statement says, because the university is committed to free and open inquiry in all matters, it guarantees all members of the university community the broadest possible latitude to speak, write, listen, challenge, and learn. It is not the proper role of the university to attempt to shield individuals from ideas and opinion they find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive. It is not the responsibility of universities to protect students from offensive speech or disagreeable, or things that hurt them. It is not their responsibility. It does not 
protect the students because it makes them stronger when they hear opinions that are highly offensive to them. It makes them sharper. If they can debate these ideas, they can be more firmly established in what they believe when they can debate the ideas. And sometimes, if their ideas, their ideas might be wrong, they can listen to somebody else's opinion and understand things in a more nuanced way. To come to understand new knowledge, that's how knowledge increases. Knowledge increases through debate, through investigation, through questions, through free speech. So this is an organization that has been extremely supportive for me. Um, every time I found myself in trouble um, in the university, FIRE has been supportive. They have provided me free um, legal advice. They have invited me already three times to attend their meetings. They pay my trip, they pay my stay, they cover my cost, and I'm able to talk to them, listen to talks, and participate in their events and learn about free speech protections, legal protections, talk to other professors with similar views as me, in the sense that they support free speech. We have all the professors that go there have all widely differing views. Um, but they have something in common. They support free speech. They support the right of others to disagree. Recently, they invited me to a free speech gala dinner in New York, and it was beautiful. It was to celebrate the fact that FIRE will not only now protect people in universities, but they protect everyone. So they're protecting the free speech of all citizens, not only people associated with universities. So this, there was a gala dinner in New York, which I attended, which was my honor. Excellent talks there, Ex in inspiring meeting. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, to which I proudly belong to, also supports free speech and freedom of conscience. They also have legal organizations that defend people of all faiths, of all conscience, to dissent. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church strongly believes in religious freedom for all people. A person's conscience, not government, should dictate his or her choice to worship or not to worship. Okay? We believe in freedom for people to believe in God or not to believe in God. To worship God according to their conscience. We believe in the freedom of religion and conscience for Muslims, for Jews, for Christians, for unbelievers, for Buddhists, etc. So, uh, other organization that supports free speech, I do not know every one of these organizations um, well, so I'm not attesting for any of them. Some of them I found on the web. Some of them I know. For example, Alumni for Free Speech Alliance, Alumni Free Speech Alliance. I am joining them to make a free speech group at MSU, um, MSU Alumni for Free Speech. So I'm making a group that will be under Alumni for Free Speech Alliance, Academic Freedom Alliance. They also work for the universities and make sure that there's freedom of speech in universities. Um, American Council of Trustees and Alumni, Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, they are more a conservative organization for free speech, but alumni, um, for example, FIRE, uh, FIRE that I mentioned before, is totally nonpartisan. They defend the free speech of all. And I think all the organizations I mentioned are nonpartisan. Just some of them, the people they tend to protect are more people with one, one side or another. But FIRE protects the freedom of all people as long as your speech is protected by the law, they will protect um, that speech. So the only speech that is not protected, by, by the way, 
the Supreme Court has gone into, th in, into this in detail, and this has been settled through several cases, but things like direct threats of violence, okay? Direct threats of violence are not protected speech. So if you threaten somebody with direct violence, and, um, that, that threaten their physical safety at the moment, that's not free speech. And there's a few other exceptions, but they are very specific exceptions, okay? They're very specific exceptions. Um, like I said, I'm starting a free speech group called MSU Alumni for Free Speech. If you are at all associated with Michigan State, please sign up. We're just beginning, um, but the more members we have, the more we can do. We will have talks, we will have meetings, and it'll be nonpartisan. We will defend free speech for all. And there's many other organizations that protect free speech. So how, how did I come to value the principles of freedom of speech and religion? One of them is my family history. Um, my grandfather became Seventh-day Adventist in Chile when a German man met him. My, my grandfather was very sick and met the German man, a fellow, um, they, they were doing business together. And this German man escaped Nazi Germany because he did not want to support Nazi Germ the Nazi army. He was against Nazism in his conscience. He could not, with a free conscience, be a soldier for Nazi Germany. And he was being forced to join. He escaped to Chile. I am sure he would have much rather to escape to Canada or the US or other areas, but they, just like now, they had more difficult immigration requirements. And um, he had to go to his probably third or fourth choice, Chile, where um, he could practice his religion freely and not, <coughs> not fight for the Nazis, which an obvious, it's obvious that Christians could have a uh, conscience problems with fighting for the Nazis. So he was a very firm supporter of freedom of speech, very firm supporter of freedom of religion, and he also firmly supported our health message, helped my grandfather get better by teaching him to eat healthier, to be vegetarian, to exercise, to be in the sunshine, and all the principles of health that we hold dear. My family became Seventh-day Adventists, and these principles were passed on from one generation to another. My grandfather passed them on to my mother. My mo I, I, I also learned from my mother and my grandparents. Um, and my mother, as a youngster, kind of rebelled, but she came back, and she's a faithful Seventh-day Adventist and holds all these principles dearly. Um, and my, my, my grandfather, my grandmother, too. So I learned from them. I also have personal experiences that um, graphically represented what lack of freedom of speech and religion can do, or even political freedom. My country was um, socialist for three years. There was um, uh, people lost their properties and businesses. Um, my, my family had businesses and they had s severe um, challenges in how to run their businesses being controlled by the government. And there was limitations, all kinds of limitations. Um, um, it significantly affected the economy. And then um, we had a dictator who was good for the economy, but he did not support people dissenting or criticizing him. So there was also um, severe limitations on freedom of speech. And some people um, were, um, uh, did suffer the consequences of speaking against him. And I saw that as a child. I did lose a best friend to this experience, um, to this situation. 
And I, I saw this as a child, and I know what it means to not be able um, to talk. I, I know what it means to, to not have freedom of speech and religion. I, I know my, my family experienced it. Um, I also can observe, I've traveled throughout the world. I've had the, the honor and privilege to travel throughout the world. And my husband is from, from um, Bosnia, and he was in the Bosnian War. And everybody was friends, and everybody was fine, until they started separating themselves into these groups. And the, the, the Serbs is, uh, were talking about separating from the Croats and from the Muslims and even neighbors that used to be good friends. They started demonizing each other and hating each other. I think the process is called balkanization. It, it, um, and they were not allowed to, to say what they wanted to say or practice their religion freely in the different republics or in the different areas of, of ex-Yugoslavia. And that led to a war and to many atrocities. I can see it in different areas of the world also. We can see what happened in the Soviet Union. I, I have two gentlemen here from the Soviet Union, uh, from the ex-Soviet Union, recording. And they, they can agree. I've heard them tell some stories. There was not a lot of freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Would you agree? Yeah. So they're nodding. Um, I think religious people, people of conscience, were you free to disagree with the power, with the government? Just read the story of Lysenko. Lysenko is a scientist that made <laughs> made big problem because his science supposedly supported Marxism. Therefore, anybody who, who went against his ideas was silenced or sent to the gulags, etc. That led to hunger and famine because instead of the best science being followed, the ideas of a man that just pleased the government were followed without listening to those that disagreed. And those that disagreed, those that dissented, were actually right. And they were right at the expense of their life, many of them, or their freedom. Asia, I've lived, I lived in, in the Pacific Islands, in Saipan. Um, a very good friends of mine um, were North Korean, escaped North Korea, and um, managed to escape and ended up in Saipan. They told me their stories and they know what lack of freedom of speech and religion and lack of freedom of everything means. Okay. There's lack of freedom of speech all over the world. So I talked a little bit about my country. You can see you can see um, the Santiago, the city where I was born, um, the tire business, and my family, Seven Day Adventist. This building right here, this old building, is where the original tire business is. It's still there on the side. You um, don't have the whole picture. Um, so we, my family also has a farm. When I was a student at MSU, an experience that I had regarding freedom of speech is that I was forced to join the MSU Graduate Student Union. I don't support unions. I perfectly support other people joining unions and supporting unions, but I had a conscience objection to join, joining unions. One is that I observed that unions can destroy countries can destroy companies and many times um, bully people, companies, countries to do things and, and support, many of them support causes that are not causes that I support. So I didn't want to join the union. 
and I was being forced to join the union. I opposed this. I was told that I was going to get kicked out or fired, I, or, um, be removed as the graduate student for not joining the union. Trembling, I said, because I was being threatened or spoken loudly by a union representative. And they're quite the bullies, by the way. And by a union representative that I had to join the union, otherwise I would, could lose my graduate student position. I firmly said, I will not join your union. I would rather not be an MSU student and lose my position than join the union. Thankfully, my professor supported me, even though he likes unions and he, he, he supports them, but he believed in my right to dissent, which is a wonderful thing. And he supported me, and I'm not sure what he did, but I did not get expelled because of not joining the union, and I did not join the union. Um, unfortunately, Michigan, the state of Michigan recently, just a few months ago, has now removed the ability to opt out of unions, all unions in the state. This is another move against the freedom of conscience. So if I join a company that has a union, I cannot opt out. That means that in Michigan, if wherever I work has a union, I couldn't work there with a free conscience, which is not freedom of speech or conscience. So, so some of my current, and, and this was in the past, this was many years ago, I'm talking about maybe like close to 20 years ago, the union situation. The situation now for freedom of speech has gone down, has, de has declined significantly. I noticed a severe decline during COVID. COVID was something incredible. We were not, it was not okay to tell our opinions. Um, we were mandated to get, vac to get vaccinated or be fired. I went through detail in a previous lecture into this story. Um, and through a letter of exemption, a religious letter of exemption, I was able not to get fired, thanks to God and to, to the help of the Village Church in Berrien Springs, who provided excellent legal advice. But like I said before, everything is related. If they don't allow medical freedom, neither will they allow freedom of speech or freedom of religion. It's all connected. When, when all the limitations of medical choices, the limitations of movement, of association, and all of this happened during COVID, it empowered those who wanted to censor us and to put limitations in other areas. After this, it became a severe problem for me. The diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings became mandatory. Some, some of these diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings really went against my conscience. And the multiple choice questions in the trainings were, in, were written in such a way that did not allow freedom of conscience. It was compelled speech because they had a question. And then there was multiple choice answers. Let's say I had a question and then the answer A, B, C, D. And they thought the right answer is B. And let's say I did not think that B was the right answer or, or the, uh, B is not the answer according to my, to my conscience. And if I chose D, for example, it did not allow me to question two. I had to select the answer B in order to, quest, to move on to question two. And even if I tried a thousand times, no, try again, no, try again. You could never move to question two without answering question one the way that they wanted 
me to answer. This was compelled speech, and this was mandatory. Without taking the training, you cannot be employed. So I, I, I complained about that one. I, I, I made some noise about that one. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion was also, it's, it's, was also being required for tenure and promotion. We need to write a statement, a statement in support of diversity, equity, and inclusion for being for continuing our, our work and to be hired. Or, well, for hiring, you need to write a diversity statement when you apply for the job. But once you're in the work, if you need a job, if you want to be promoted, you need to write a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. Diversity, equity, and inclusion sounds good. But there are several things that are a problem with these concepts. Some of the concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion are diametrically opposed to the beliefs of many religious people. Among them, there's a few things that are against my beliefs. Among them is that they view race as, um, they, they really focus on, on race. They don't, view, they don't view humans as just one human race or one human family. They view race as very distinct and separate, and they favor certain races to get hired over others. It is my belief that it's the only correct way to hire people is to select people on their competence. Can they do the job well or not? And it is best for whatever discipline they're going, let's say if they're a brain surgeon, it is best for that medical, for that medical hospital and for the patients for the best brain surgeon to be hired regardless of race. And it is also better for the doctor, for the individual being hired because if he's not being hired based on competence, if he's being hired as a diversity hire or through the process of diversity, equity, and inclusion through these principles, then the patients, his colleagues, might look at the person down and might think, maybe this is not a diverse, this is a diversity hire. Maybe, the, maybe he's not able to do the job as well as I can and look down on them. And this is unfair. This is unfair. If the person is a qualified and very competent person, he should be viewed as an equal. And the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or you say diversity hiring, is unfair to everyone. It harms everyone because hiring should be based on competence and merit only. This is the best for science on also. What about if Einstein in his time was not able to write a good diversity statement? Maybe he would not have been hired. Maybe he would not have made all the amazing discoveries that he did. We would not have the theory of relativity. This is not the way it should be done. Science, hiring, medicine, all of this. All the hirings and promotion should be done on the basis of competence and merit only. So this, this the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, um, principles are against my conscience. Also, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings many times force me and others to affirm values and morals that go directly against my conscience and other people's conscience. In LGBT, LGBTQ issues, they are forcing mandatory, they, they are mandating affirmation of the gender ideology, which is unscientific and not true and against religious teachings. This is a problem even for atheists, which like I will point, point in a future, in a, in, in the next slide. Um, even atheists, because even, even atheists have a conscience too. 
Some of them, just like all people, some of them are very honest and they're following the truth according to their conscience and they want to say the truth. They don't want to be forced to lie. Should they be forced to lie and go against their scientific beliefs just like Galileo was forced to recant that the earth went around the sun and because the church was saying that the, actually the earth, the sun went around the earth? This is what is happening. We are being forced to say that the sun goes around the earth when it's very obvious and it's scientifically provable that the earth goes around the sun. So um, um, I, came, I work at MSU. I came back to MSU. This is when I was hired in 2017. Like I mentioned, the COVID mandates and exemption happened, mandatory DEI statement. There's mandatory affirmation of DEI and gender ideology. This, this was already happening before COVID happened, but it was more like a social pressure. And then after COVID, it became mandated from the university. You had to fill out forms. You have to fill out mandatory trainings. You know, it became compelled. The pressure was already there socially, but after COVID, it like gave them, um, a, it, it allowed for people who wanted this to happen, it gave them confidence because of all the violations of freedom that they were able to accomplish with COVID, it, it gave them permission to violate freedoms of speech, to violate freedom of conscience. So I wrote a couple articles. One article is next, and this article opened the gates of hell for me. Okay, this article really changed my life <laughs> for the worse <laughs> or for the better. I guess I became a bit famous or infamous, one of the two. So um, um, I joined a group called Heterodox STEM. Heterodox STEM is, is a group of scientists that, um, ha that believe in freedom of speech and also that believe that we should be able to dissent, that we should be able to disagree with other scientists. And we, were, we have this group called Heterodos Temp, and we have a substack. And every week, one member of the group will write an article about a different topic. And the articles are on diverse topics, some of them are controversial, etc. Not every single article I agree with this. That's why it's called heterodox means different beliefs. So um, we mainly support that we have freedom to dissent. Okay? And I wrote one article, and this article is the new gender ideology is being used to coerce speech at universities. And I made the case that um, I was being coerced, and not only me, many others, to affirm the gender ideology by filling forms that are worded in such a way that demand affirmation of the new gender ideology. It is required to fill out the demographic questions that force denial of biological reality because mammals are sexually dimorphic, deny thousands of years of historical precedent, and go against religious beliefs. Even scientists with an atheist worldview have written against this new ideology because they do not want to lie. For example, Dawkins in 2022 wrote, sex is pretty damn binary. Male versus female is one of the few surprising Dichotom genuine dichotomies that can justly escape censure. Okay, in a Yuga poll for June 6, 2022, 63% of Americans agree with the traditional and biological definition of sex and do not want gender identity to be included as a definition. Okay, um, the not um, definition 
of sex protected by Title IX. Notwithstanding this, academ notwithstanding this, academic institutions are compelling affirmation of a belief that is not grounded in biology and that most Americans do not support. It is very strange that the survey assumes that race is fixed when it's really a spectrum. For example, I have Spanish, Chinese, North African, and Native American ancestries. And the same form pretends that gender is on a spectrum, 11 options in most Michigan State surveys, when it is clearly binary, mammals are sexually dimorphic, to participate in most federally funded events or fill most forms related to the institution, it is required that one affirm that gender is on a spectrum, not biologically based and not binary, therefore forcing me and others to lie in order to participate in most programs. This is not freedom of speech. So I wrote that article. This caused me a lot of problem. Um, um, I received a lot of hate, pages of insults, including um, people in my, that worked with me, you know, people in my department um, saying things like, like, I don't deserve to live, and many insults, you know, the typical insults, transphobes and all those other insults, um, too many to mention. Um, um, and I, my, my supervisor met with me. Um, she, she was upset. There were students advocating for my firing. I think they're still advocating for my firing all the time. Some people put in publicly on Twitter that I need to be fired, even people who are in my department. So I'm um, um, publicly being called to be fired. Um, constantly <laughs> um, after this article. And um, my supervisor uh, told me that I need to take the article down. Um, uh, no, I wouldn't do it. And uh, she said that I need to remove my MSU credentials because it says Marisol, Marisol Quintanilla, PhD is an hematologist at Michigan State University. She said that I need to remove my PhD, my, my credentials, because there's a policy at Michigan State that, um, that she sent me the policy, the text, that pretty much said that, you know, you couldn't say in behalf of the university things that were against their values. I don't remember exactly the, 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 the policy that she sent me, but that was the gist of it. And I said, no, I will not remove my credentials because my credentials belong to me. Um, um, this was a battle for a while, a debate, um, fire. Again, I spoke about them before. I am greatly indebted to fire. Fire helped me, gave me some of the legal arguments and cases, there are several legal cases that demonstrated that yes, I had the freedom of speech to dissent. In public university especially, I could criticize this and I did have freedom of speech and what I said was protected by law and that I could include my credentials. Um, I did not send her all those laws, but I did refuse to, re, um, to remove my credentials. I am sure she met with a lawyer because after a while of battle with me and me not backing down, thanks to God, I did not back down. Um, she said that I did not need to remove my credentials. I'm sure she talked to a lawyer at MSU and he informed her that she could not do that to me, that I could, that I had the right to, to dissent and I had the right to use my credentials and that my credentials belonged to me. So thank God and I also thank FIRE that supported me through this. Um, a group of scientists, uh, me, Dorian, Dorian Abbott, 
which is a physicist from University of Chicago, David Bertoli and Luana Maroya. Uh, we wrote this article opposing on the amendments for Title IX um, that would redefine sex as well as limit free expression and due process. So this article um, expresses um, or, or criticizes the new proposed Title IX revisions. I encourage you to contact your congressman, to contact your senator, to write directly to the federal government if you can, because these new changes to Title IX are concerning. So one thing, the ref freedom of it affects freedom of speech, freedom of religion, protection of women, women's rights, scientific integrity, rule of law, etc. I want to read the freedom of speech part. The redefinition of sex in the proposed Title IX revisions will threaten the academic freedom of researchers, faculty, and students who oppose the redefinition of gender and sex. It would also make criticism of aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion mandates involving gender and sex more difficult. Freedom of religion. There's a binary interpretation of sex in many religion texts. For example, Genesis 5.2, which reads, male and female created he them. If enacted, the proposed revisions to Title IX would force believers to affirm non-binary claims regarding gender and sex against their conscience. Therefore, Title IX would promote a violation of people's First Amendment guaranteed freedom of religion. It would remove protection of women, because now men could access women's private spaces in sports, in changing rooms, in bathrooms. It would affect women's rights. Among the changes is the redefinition of what sex refers to and sex discrimination to include gender identity and sexual orientation. The proposed amendments will signal an end of sex-based protection for women and girls scientific integrity. There are only two gametes in mammals, egg and sperm. Mammals are sexually dimorph dimorphic and sex is binary, and we would be forced to deny this biological reality with the new Title IX. And the rule of law, because the, in, in 1972, Title IX was enacted by the Congress of the United States of America, who represent the people. If it is to be changed so drastically to mean something totally different, this should be done by Congress, not by unelected government bureaucrats. What is happening is being changed by the Department of Education and the Biden administration, and not by Congress, because it could not pass Congress. Due process, the, title, the new Title IX regulations roll back vital due process protection for college students facing sexual misconduct allegations. So the Title IX offerings becomes the judge, jury, and executioner for people who are accused of Title IX violations or sexual misconduct, and some people that might be innocent might face punishment since they will not have the proper investigation and proper due process that is allowed by our government, that by our laws. To, we encourage the Department of Education to reconsider the proposed changes to Title IX so we can keep our educational institutions of the United States a wonderful place to study and live. So, we also, I joined a group of scientists, 29 scientists, among them two Nobel Prize winners, and all scientists of high category, but highly esteemed scientists. I am the least of them all. And we wrote a paper in defense of merit in science. This paper got rejected from many important journals, and we had to publish it in the Journal of Controversial Ideas. The fact that this important paper had to be published in the Journal of Controversial Ideas became a story of, in and it of itself. And it was 
It was talked about. There was articles written in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, and others. You can find the original paper and most of the articles written about it and uh, podcasts and um, talks, etc. There was articles written in, in other countries in Europe about this paper, and you can find it all in this website, indefenseofmerit.org. So if you want to read the paper, you can find it in defenseofmerit.org. Okay? Here you can find in defenseofmerit.org. This is how it looks like. Um, it has, um, you can find um, the article, the preprint. So the article is available here. If you click here and the full paper, you click there. And you can read the Wall Street Journal article and um, below, if, as you keep on scrolling down, you will find the link to the New York Times article and many podcasts, etc. This is a screenshot of the New York Times article in which I was um, interviewed. So the New York Times called me a few weeks ago and asked me questions about this paper and my experience with diversity, equity, and inclusion, etc. Mainly, Oh, I, mainly, the paper that we wrote defended a couple principles. One is that hiring in science, selection of, in hiring and promotion in science should be based on merit only and not because of diversity considerations. It should not be based on race or in sex or gender or whatever you you, whatever category you want to select people by, but it should be based on merit only. So, a chemist should be hired because he's an excellent chemist and the most qualified for that position, and nothing else. And a physicist should be hired because he's an excellent or she's an excellent physicist, notwithstanding the race or sex or um, f national origin, etc. Also, our paper rejects pseudoscience, such as the, um, uh, being forced to affirm the gender ideology. Um, and um, the paper supports many of the positions that I support, that I spoke about before. Not 100% everything. I mean, they don't agree with me in everything, and I don't agree with them in everything, but the, uh, the, we all have in common that we support that hiring should be based on competence and merit, and science is too important to play these games. Science is too important to play these games, and that we should be allowed to follow the truth wherever it leads, even if it is offensive to some and that we should be allowed the right to free speech and debate, especially at universities. Universities are institutions of learning. They are not modeling agencies. It doesn't matter in universities. It should not matter what the professors or students look like. It should matter what they know. Their ideas, the knowledge, debate, because they're institutions of learning and not modeling agencies. We must all defend freedom of speech and religion if we want to still have it. Speak up. I have experienced several times when I speak, I'm in a meeting. And I say, I speak against diversity, equity, and inclusion and the very strong discrimination against people of faith or hiring of white men. There's clear discrimination against hiring of white men at universities. I have even heard people say things like, effing white men, we want to replace them. I have heard faculty say things like that. And People, other faculty, 
will listen, will say nothing when I protest to these things. To pro I protest censorship. I protest mandatory affirmation of DEI principles or um, mandatory DEI statements for tenure and promotion. And in the meetings, most people don't say anything. But they send some, send emails to me privately. And they say they support what I'm saying, but they but I said, please don't tell anyone that I support what you're saying. And often I tell them, please speak up. Please speak up. Because if it's several of us, we will be stronger. If it's several of us, you know, it's harder to attack several instead of just me speaking up. And I have found out that the majority of people are cowards. And this has been in most of history. Think about World War II. If the majority of Germans would have spoken up against Hitler, and they would have followed their conscience that it was wrong to remove the property, the liberty of Jews, would there have been a Holocaust? Could Hitler have done the work? without all his, the, the supporters the, or, or people who just followed orders? He probably personally didn't kill very many, maybe none during that time. It was all people following orders and um, allowing for these atrocities to happen. So I have learned that there are several groups of people some that are easily manipulated, and they can be manipulated and persuaded um, about things that are not true. S some understand what is the truth, but they're too cowardly to stand up, especially when the price of speaking, when there's a price, losing their job, facing ridicule, and <laughs> It's incredible how powerful ridicule is. People are very afraid of being ridiculed. Being afraid of facing opposition of some, in, in some when things get worse, losing their liberty, their job, etc. And people are afraid and they go along silently. Those are cowards. And there's a few people who are really ideological and they're carrying the thing forward. You know, in, in Nazi Germany, you could say that is Hitler and his most firm supporters. And then there are those that know the truth, oppose the lies, and stand up and speak out. You, you, we can think of doing Nazi Germany, somebody like Bonhoeffer. Now there's a few people standing up. I would say these scientists that join me in the paper, they're standing up against really the wrong and unfairness being done on people who are the most meritorious and competent and not being hired because of this DI ideas. And they're standing against censorship and standing for things like free speech, freedom of conscience, ability to debate, and the importance of following the truth and the evidence wherever it leads. And speaking and defending the right of the defenseless over the ones without power to speak. Because throughout all history, the most vulnerable have been the ones that have faced the most censorship. So if you believe in defending the vulnerable, allow for freedom of speech. Allow for dissent. Allow those that you despise to speak. Because if you don't allow hate speech, you don't support free speech. Because what is hate speech? Hate speech is speech that you severely despise. And sometimes that very despised speech can be true.
So I want to quote the, one of my favorite verses again about speech. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. And now therefore go, and I will be with, thou mouth, with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Finally, we must all defend free speech and conscience. Speak up. Freedom of speech is the foundation of all civil liberties. Speech is not free if the speech we despise is not allowed. Do unto others what you would like them to do to you. Freedom of speech and conscience protects everyone, especially the most vulnerable and without power. Give a voice to the voiceless. Stand for freedom of speech and for freedom of conscience.